Uh, Ezekiel chapter 4 and chapter 5. We're going to take on a couple of chapters tonight. And uh, I'm going to have some uh, things for you to um, just consider here up on the screen. And then we're just going to take off running here with these two chapters. Um, it's, it's interesting what, what we are going to be seeing in chapter 4 chapter 5. Because as you see prophecy from the time it was given, from the time uh, the Lord uh, will have Ezekiel go about and, and do these things. And then when you start reading this, these two chapters, and then you're going to see the things that have happened, and that they happen exactly as the Lord said that they would happen. And that, you know, that will do a couple of things. Number one, it, it makes you realize that God honors his word, that he's faithful. And second, it makes you realize that judgment is imminent. It is coming. It's coming, and there's no way we can get out of it. No one will. And so <clears throat> uh, uh, the thing is here in chapters 4 and chapter 5, we're going to see how uh, before, th these are, this is probably happening some, fa some say four, five, six years before the actual events take place. So remember, Ezekiel is... Uh, in this area near Babylon uh, city, um, it's called the Kevar River, and he is there with the rest of the exiles, 10,000 people that were taken. And when he is there, he has a vision of God's glory, and then he is going to receive his commissioning from the Lord. Remember, Ezekiel was a priest, and the Bible at the beginning says not just a priest, but the priest. Now, he's not the high priest, but he will act as if he were the high priest for that people in that particular time. But he is commissioned by the Lord to be, rather than a priest, a prophet. But a lot of the things he will do and he will say gives you an understanding how he went through the training and learning things about being a priest. But remember that in the previous chapter, the Lord says, now, Ezekiel, I'm going to close your mouth. I'm going to shut your mouth. And now in these two chapters here, you're going to see that he is going to act out whatever is the message that God has for him, or actually for the people through him. So now he's going to start doing some things that in, in, in our perspective, or from our perspective, things that look ridiculous. That, that how in the world is he going to do these things? And yet, this is the powerful message, message that God wants to bring to his people, because one thing is true. When you decide that you don't want to hear what people have, have you ever had an argument with someone and it says, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> uh, you know, late, ladies are good at that. Don't want to hear it, don't want to hear it. And, and, and this is the condition of the people here, that they don't want to hear what God has to say. And, and the Lord is, is going to say through Ezekiel, I know you don't want to hear it. I know that you're stiff-necked people, he says, but you're going to have to see these things that are going to be taking place. So we're going to read a few verses here. In chapter 4, what we are going to have, we're going to have the chapter basically in, in two uh, uh, chunks here. From verses 1 to verse 8, we're going to have the siege of the city. And this is going to be put in such a dramatical way that you're going to be like, wow. God, when he wants to get your attention, he goes to whatever extremes he has to because he really wants his people to hear. So verses 1 to 8 in chapter 4, the siege, and then verses 9 to 17, we're going to see the suffering of the people. And then when we get to chapter 5, we're going to see uh, um, how the illustration of these things. And then finally, at the end of chapter 5, we're going to see the scattering of uh, the people of Israel. Remember, these things are happening as, as a judgment for the people of Israel particularly to the southern kingdom, but in, in these verses you're going to see that it's involving the whole nation of Israel because both of them, the northern kingdom and the, and the southern kingdom, they're both guilty. And so this is going to be for the nation of Israel, and this is going to be in a way that it will be so radical that they will have no excuse saying that they did not know. So we read in chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, this. You also, son of man, take a clay tablet and lay it before you and portray it, portray it on it a city, Jerusalem. Lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mound against it. Set camps against it also, and place battering rams against it all around. Moreover, take, your, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city, 
Set your face against it, and it shall be, it shall be besieged, and you shall, you shall lay siege against it. This will be assigned to the house of Israel. Notice, it's not the house of Judah now. It's the house of Israel. Now, now notice this. Let also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that you lay on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have completed them, lay again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. It, I have laid on you a day for each year. Therefore, you shall set your face towards the siege of Jerusalem. Your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. And surely I will restrain you so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have ended the days of your siege. What in the world is this? He says, now, uh, Ezekiel, this is what I want you to do. Go to the sandbox, if you will, and you're going to play soldiers. <laughs> so he's going to have some clay. And on it, he's going to, I think it is in a sense of just portraying the city of Jerusalem in this clay. This is a piece of clay. And then he's going to lay siege around it. And then it's going to have a little ramp as they used to in those days. Remember, most of the cities will have a huge wall around for protection. And the way the, the, uh, the enemy, uh, the armies will come in, they will start building a ramp so they can go up to the wall. If they had access to the wall, then from that wall they can penetrate the city. And so the Lord is telling Ezekiel, this is what you're going to do. Build something here that portrays the city of Jerusalem. And, and then you're going to have all these things around. But what is interesting here is that he says to Ezekiel that he's going to get this piece of metal. Now, if you go to the book of Leviticus, book of Numbers, you can see that in the sacrificial system. That's why it is interesting that Ezekiel was supposed to be a priest. But he understands everything that the Lord is saying here. He says, get this piece of metal, like, like, a, like a cast iron uh, uh, pan or whatever, that was actually used for sacrifices in the temple. And he says, this is what you're going to get. Get that piece of metal, and then you're going to be laying on your side. Now, you can just imagine. He's on the ground, on his side, and then he's going to use, pretend this is a piece of metal, Here's the city that he is building, and, and, and then he's going to have the, like this. I mean, for 390 days. Now, of course, we understand that he's not going to be there, there all day long. But every day for 390 days, he's going to have to do this for whatever length of time he's doing it. 390 days. Why 390 days? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody does. I mean, I, I, I was listening to Chuck Misler. Anybody here familiar with Chuck Misler? Good night. I finished like 500 things of Tylenol with the headache that I got. How he explains those 390 days. He says, well, the, the kingdom of the, nor the northern kingdom, they were ruling for 390 years. and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't add up. It doesn't. And, and, and I don't think that God had the idea of having us go crazy about trying to figure out the 300. If I don't figure out the 349, then I mean the 390 days, it doesn't make sense. No, what he's saying is, listen, I want you to do this. He says, this is to the house of Israel because this is how huge is their iniquity. And this is how huge is my anger against their iniquity. And then he says, and then you're going to turn to the other side, and you're going to do the same. Now you're on the left side. That's going to be for the house of Israel. It says for the house of Israel, it's only 40 days. But the difference between 380 and 40 days, it's, it's, it's really to say that even though their sin is not as the sin of the northern kingdom, they are guilty as well. That's what the Lord is trying to say. So I don't, I'm not going to go crazy trying to figure it out because I read books on this thing. Nobody got it right. So... I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to spend the little bit of brain that I have left on that because then I'll go crazy like uh, I mean more than I am already going crazy. So what what this is important here is that it says set your face against. That expression set your face again, you're going to see how God throughout the Old Testament he says I'm going to set my face again. 
That is, I am declaring my anger and I am completely against this nation. Setting your face against is like starting a fight with somebody, someone. That's what, that's what the whole thing is here. He says, I am so angry with this uh, nation that I am like, like provoke. I don't know, some of you guys, I remember being a kid, starting fights with other kids, and you go like this, put your face in front of them. I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking in my, my mind, this is like provoking, like, like saying, you know what, I'm, I'm angry, and I'm going to do something about it. But, but the whole point here, set your face against it, is that every day people will go out and see Ezekiel on his right side for 390 days, and they, they, they will have to come to the conclusion, okay, it's enough. How long are you going to... Remember, he's not saying anything. He cannot say anything. And they see the same thing daily. I mean, how long is this going to go? Here's the problem. The people of Israel, they are in exile in Babylon. But in their minds, later on we're going to discover this. You know the, the, the attitude they had? Is they're saying like, relax, this is not going to go forever. Soon, very soon we're going back home. It's all going to be okay. You know what? God probably, he already forgotten all of these things about, you know, judgment and that. And, and he's, he's not really, you know, concerned about these things. That's what they're going to say in, in, in a few chapters, uh, you know, in the next few weeks. So they are saying, like, you know what? It ain't going to happen. But here's the problem. They're saying, we're going back to the city. Little do they understand that it is the city that is going to be destroyed. And for those who are in the city, saying like, what is, it, what is that that you're going to have your hope? Because remember, there is a remnant of people in the city. And for them, what they're saying like, okay, here's the problem though. If we don't have a city, where are we going? What's going to be with us? So for this group of people, they're saying, we're going back to the city. And the people in the city said, no, no, no. There, is no, there ain't going to be no more city. What are we going to do? And the Lord says, I'm glad you ask, because I have just the answer for you. And what is going to be the answer is what he starts saying here in verse 9 forward. But what, before you get there, this is what I want to show you here. <clears throat> if you can see in the next uh, uh, um, image here, what you're going to see is I want to show you something that I found very interesting. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, this verse 4-9 here. Notice what it says, Ezekiel 4.9. Also take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. Put them into one vessel and make bread of them for yourself. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat it. Now notice what, what, what I want to tell you about this. In the next uh, image here, what you're going to see is this. Are you familiar with that kind of bread? Some of you like it, huh? Some of you buy it, and I, I, I particularly think it's nasty, but not, that's okay. But, but, but notice what it says, Ezekiel 4.9. But I want to point something to you. I, I know you like this bread, and, and I know, but let me, let me just point something to you. Very interesting here. The ne look at the next image. This is what they said about why they call this bread Ezekiel 4.9. It says, Ezekiel 4.9, products are crafted in the likeness of the Holy Scripture verse Ezekiel 4.9 to ensure rival, honest nutrition and pure delicious flavors. Now notice the next one. We discover when these six grains, you see that? Can you read it? Notice what he says there. When they get this combination, exactly what the, what the Lord is, is giving Ezekiel here. He says, what are you going to get? Get for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. These guys, I think it's, it's, it's called uh, Food for Life or something, the company that makes this bread. They said this, when we combine all of these <laughs> grains and legumes and all of that, it says an amazing thing happens. A complete protein is created that contains all nine essentials, essential amino acids. Now this is science. But Ezekiel had no science. And this is what I want, why I wanted to point this. Now, I, this is not a commercial for Ezekiel 49 anyway. They ain't going to give me nothing. And even if they do give me something, I don't like it. But, but what I want to show you is this. Because, see, from their perspective in the days of Ezekiel, 
when they heard, this is what you're going to eat, Ezekiel. The last two mentioned here, millet and spelt, they were used for animals. Nobody will dare using that for human consumption. It would only be mixed with the other grains when there was a famine. And so when the Lord says, Ezekiel, this is what you're going to eat. From their perspective, he's saying, that's cruel. That's unbelievable. How in the world can God do that to his servant? Because after all, Ezekiel is in that condition, in that situation, in those circumstances, because he's serving the Lord. And people can say that. And, and, and throughout history, people have always blamed God for things that they don't know. Now, through science, we understand that the combination of all of these items here that he's saying, it has exactly what a person needs, not only to survive, but to keep a healthy, healthy, healthy body. So that God in his, in, in, in his anger and in, 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 in judging the people, God also knows exactly what you need. And what I'm saying is because when you go, when I go, when we go through the pain, we think that all of the things that are combined are making our lives miserable, we don't understand. Some of those things are actually making you stronger in your character in one way or another. So rather than pointing the finger at God, think about God is the God of the universe. And he definitely knows what I need better than I do myself. And in, 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 in the times when he has to correct me, he doesn't judge us no more because the judgment was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. But when he has to correct you and me and all of us, he knows exactly what you need and why he has to correct you. He doesn't discipline like you do with your kids. He disciplines us with the purpose of making you stronger in the faith. And I thought I wanted to point that because that's what, that's what Ezekiel is going to have to learn here. Verse 9, he says, this is what you're going to eat. But look, in verse 10, it gets more interesting, even, even, even better here. Verse 10, chapter 4, and your food which you eat shall be weighed 20 shekels a day from time to time you shall eat it. You know how much is 20 shekels here? Eight ounces. And notice this. You shall also drink water by measure, one-sixth of a hen from time to time you shall drink. You know how much water is that? Six ounces. How would you like to have a diet of eight ounces of food and six ounces of water a day? And why is he saying that to Ezekiel? Because remember, even though they have, they, even though they have seen Babylon already twice, they came the first time, they come the second time, and they are already taking thousands of people to captivity. Even though they have seen that, they are in Jerusalem thinking like, relax, this is all going to be okay. God is not going to do that. I mean, we are his people after all. Because you know what? God is love, isn't he? God is good. And little did they remember. Turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 26, please. Let me show you something there. You there? It's very interesting how these things are going to work out here. Because when, when you get to Leviticus, beginning in verse 14... Chapter 26, verse 14. I'm going to read a bunch of verses here because I want you to get the picture and want why these things are going on. Now, this is Leviticus. This is at the very beginning. Remember, the first five books of the law, the Torah. This is, uh, 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 so the people, uh, what is the purpose of the first five books of the Torah? It, it, they were put together. They were given to the people of Israel. So now that they, once they make it out of, uh, Egypt, being in slavery in Egypt, and now they're going to enter the promised land. The first five books of the law were supposed to teach the people how to rightly relate with holy God. They are coming out of uh, the land of Israel, they, they, uh, 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 the land of Egypt. They, they have lived in, in, in all of these things, and they said, now you're going to be a new, there's going to be a new beginning. He says, but you're going to have to learn how to relate to a holy God. And forget all the other things of the past. Now you're going to have to understand God is holy. God is righteous. And there's only one way you can relate to him. And this is what the Lord says to them. Chapter 26, verse 14. So bear with me, okay? But if you do not obey me 
and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, and if your soul abhors my judgment, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I, will, I also will do this to you. Listen to this. I will live and appoint terror over you, wasting the seas and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow to the heart of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you. Does that sound familiar? I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron hmm, and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring you on, your, on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy you, your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, hmm, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you seven times more. For your sins, and I will bring a sword against you that you will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have cut you off, cut, cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your, of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. I will let your cities waste. And bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will, I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword against you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy the Sabbath. You see this? That's enough. I don't want to continue reading in that. This is sad. So what is the problem with the people of Israel? It's definitely not ignorance. What is it? Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 says this, Because the sentence against, against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. What does that mean? It means because judgment does not come quick enough, we think that we're getting away with it. And that was the problem with Israel. Remember, the same God who loved the world so much and gave his only begotten son is the same God who is sending his son from heaven to bring judgment upon the world. The same son who came to die for the sins of the world is the same son who's coming to judge the sin of the world. God is loved. Yes, that's, that's true. God is good. Yes, we know that. But also we need to remember God is just and God is holy. Righteous God. And God must judge the wicked or he will not be just. But even in judgment, God is always long-suffering and he's always good. And that's the problem with people. Don't understand what God is trying to teach us, and when we don't do that, then we go about the way of rebellion. Back to Ezekiel, please. So here they are. They are seeing through Ezekiel, because he's not saying anything, he's just acting up this message. And he says, when they see him, Ezekiel, why are you only eating that much? Why are you only drinking that much? Ezekiel could have easily said, oh, there's going to be a day when you wish you had this much. 
and you will have nothing. Now notice, verse, verse 11, you shall also drink water by measure. Verse 12, and you shall eat it as, verse 12, okay, Ezekiel 4, verse 12. And you shall eat it as barley cakes and bake it using fuel of human waste in their sight. Huh? How about that for lunch, huh? <laughs> then the Lord said, So shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, where I will drive them. So I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, indeed I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, not, nor has abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. And look at God. I mean, God says, this is what I want you to do. And Ezekiel says, no. And look at the patience of God. Verse 15. Then he said to me, see, I am giving you cow dung. Okay, let's make it better. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Instead of human waste. And you shall prepare your bread over it. Moreover, he said to me, son of man. Surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety. Can you imagine that? You only have this much to eat and you're anxious. How long is this going to last? Are we going to have anything to? I mean, I, and shall drink water by measure and with dread. Such a horrible condition. In the book of Lamentation, chapter 1, verse 11, I'll read it to you. All her people sighed, they seek bread, they have given their valuable for food to restore life. So, <laughs> that's the condition, that, that, this is Jeremiah, you know that. Lamentation is Jeremiah, it says, all her people sighed, they, have, they seek bread, they have given their valuables for food to restore life. And then in chapter 4, same book, verse 9, it's amazing how it says, those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger. For these pine away, stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. But then listen to this. The hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Can you even imagine that? Josephus, I think... Uh, he documented this case when, in the year 70, when Titus, the general, the Roman general, comes into the city of Jerusalem and they siege and all of that, and, and, and they are definitely dying of starvation. He documented that the women who are pregnant, uh, they, they cut open their wombs and they break the bodies of the little ones against the wall so they could eat them. In the desperation, uh, they either had babies will, will, will do the best they could to, to grab the babies and cast them out to the other side of the wall if they could before they were eaten. In verse 17 in chapter 4, that they might lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away because of their iniquity. That word, waste, those two words, waste away, is one word in the Hebrew. It, it, the word waste away, those, those two words actually made up the word makak. And that meaning of that is putrefied, rotten, generating pus, progressively deteriorating. The Lord says, and this is what you see right now, and it will progressively get worse and worse and worse. As, as, as a wound when it is generating pus and, and it smells and it stinks and it's, it's... This is what sin does to people. This is what God says about stiff-necked people who refuse to humble themselves. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and, 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 and 8. You, you know those verses because they definitely go together with this thing here. And it is, it is painful to be reminded of this truth in, in, in our society. And we see the things that are going on in our society. And they fail to remember. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. 
For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. And that's just the truth. This is, this is God saying, these people. R remember, judgment is not really upon them at the moment. This is four or five years before they actually go through this. They are under, they have been under attack twice already, but, but, but the sin is still there. But it's about to get worse. 586, and here comes Nebuchadnezzar, and he will destroy the whole city here. Chapter 5 now, verse 1. And you, son of man, take a sharp sword, take it as a barber's razor, and pass it over your head and your beard. Then take, oh, what a, is he going to shave everything? Then take scales to weight and divide the hair. Take, take, take that into consideration, okay? He shaves everything. And then all of that hair, he's going to put it on the scales. Verse 2, you shall burn it with fire one third. You shall burn with fire one third of the midst of the city. When the days of the siege are finished, then you shall take one third and strike it around it with the sword. And one third you shall scatter in the wind. I will draw out a sword after them. Hmm. So this is what he's going to say. Now, this is not a, a razor uh, or, or that normally was used for shaving. Be, uh, before that, for them to shave their heads, it was a sign of mourning. Uh, you only do that when, 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 when you're grieving the loss of a loved one. And, and when you do that, uh, it, it, it's offensive uh, to people. It, it, it's a sign of humiliation. It's, it's, it's also a sign of, of pain. And, and, and it's, it's just horrible. And the Lord's going to say to him, this is what you're going to do. Now, here are three things that he's going to say to, to, to Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel, this is going to be a, a set of thirds, three thirds here. And they all, they each have one thing that they, they point to each individually. He's going to get the hair and he's going to divide it in, in, in three equal amounts. One, he's going to take it and he's going to burn it. And he said, this is how Jerusalem is going to burn. <laughs> then the other one, he's going to grab the same sword that he used for shaving himself. And he's going to grab that and he's going to go around the, the, the city and he's going to be chopping it in small little pieces. And the third of that, the, the last third of that, he says, you're going to grab the whole thing and you're just going to throw it up in the air and let the wind take it in every direction. Verse 3. But there's hope. You shall, you shall also take a small number of them and bind them in the edge of your garment. Every time you see that small number, it's always pointing to the remnant. It's unbelievable. I was, I was looking at some numbers here. In 1939, the Jewish population in the world was close to uh, 18 million people. They said 16.9, 17.4, close to, to 18 million people, 1939. In 1945, that population have diminished by 30% after the Holocaust, when 6 million Jews die. And after that, it was suffering for the Jewish people, living as refugees, and everywhere they went, they were persecuted, mocked, pushed away, rejected. But the beautiful thing here is that he says to Ezekiel, take a small number of them and bind them in the edge of your garment, meaning they will be safe. They will be secure there. <laughs> then out of that little small remnant, in verse 4 in chapter 5, it says, Then take some of them again and throw them in the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. From, the, from there a fire will go out into all the house of Israel. But then verse 5, notice this. This is, uh, verse 5, Thus says the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. This is what the Lord says. This is the pride, the joy and pride of the people. Because when things, went going, when things were going great, they will say, we're God's people. 
We're good. But God says, look, this is Jerusalem. What does that tell you? Well, this is supposed to be the people you love, the city you love. This is your city. This is your people. Why is this going on here? Because judgment must begin in the house of the Lord, yeah? First Peter chapter 4. Why is this coming upon her, upon Jerusalem? Well, notice the sin. Verse 6. She has rebelled against my judgment by doing wickedness more than the nation and the nations and against my statues more than the countries that are all around her. It was supposed to be that Israel, the nation of Israel, was supposed to be a light to the Gentile nations. And God says, you were supposed to be a light. You were supposed to bring people to the saving knowledge of God. That they will come and they will walk away from their idolatry and their evil practices and their abominations and all of that. And they will come to worship the true living God because they see you faithfully worshiping your God. But contrary to that, the Lord says, you're not, even, you're not only just like them, you are worse than them. They have some sense of decency. You don't. You're not only imitating the, the nations of the world, you are exceedingly more wicked than these nations. When they stop because there's some sense of morality per se, you go to the extremes and you are worse than they are. Why? Well, because, listen, privilege brings responsibility. And God has revealed so much to the people of Israel. He have, I mean, how many miracles how they were set free from the bondage in Egypt and then through the wilderness and through the nations. And God says, I'm going to give you a land where there, there flows milk and honey and uh, all of those things and cities that you didn't build and all of these fields that you didn't work for. I'm going to give you the abundance of that just because you're my people, not because you're special, you're insignificant, you're nothing, you're good and next to nothing. Yet I desire to, worship, uh, to, to give you these things so that you will worship me. None of that was true of the nation of Israel. You're worse than the nations around you. Verse 7, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations. So two things here. One is deception and second, disobedience. They were deceiving themselves thinking that it's all going to be okay because we are his people. That's deception. Second, they're not only deception, but they are disobedient. Because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations that are all around you. Have not walked in my statutes, nor kept my judgments, not even done according to the judgments of the nations that are all around. He says, you, you are so wicked that you are even disobedient to the things that they have for standards of living. You're worse than they are. Now, verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I, even I, am against you, and I will execute judgment in your midst in the sight of the nations. Do you want to, the Lord says, you want to deceive people and you want to disobey me in front of these nations? I'm going to punish you in front of this, all these nations. Uh, And I will do among you what I have never done, and the like of which I will never do again because of all your abominations. We're going to get into those abominations, and it's going to make you sick in your stomach. I will do among you what I have never done, and the like of which I will never do again. Can you imagine that? Therefore, verse 10, fathers shall eat their sons in your meat, and sons shall eat their fathers. And I will execute judgment among you, and all of you who remain, I will scatter to all the winds. So now, you will have no city to trust, and you will have no people. <laughs> you will have no identity. But notice that I and all of you who remain, I will scatter you to all the winds, meaning all over the world. After that attack on Jerusalem, the, the, the Jewish family was at the lowest point in history. They were fighting for survival. 
Verse 11, therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with, with all of your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore, I will also diminish you. That diminish you. Ay, ay, ay. That's scary. Let me read to you out of the book of Zechariah. See how scary that is. The Lord says, I will diminish you. You think about the Holocaust, six million people. They said that now, just now, Israel is just about getting to the same amount of people, Jewish people, that, 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 that the numbers getting there, up there just as before the Holocaust, just before. And, and it's interesting that just before uh, they get to that number again, here comes this conflict. And it's not looking better for them. I, ha I have to say this. Zechariah says this in chapter 13, verse 8. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. Only one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, <laughs> and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. When? Let's just think about if the population of Israel was to be 18 million people, 12 million of them will die. When is this? This is the time of the tribulation. <sighs> Why? Because you have defiled my sanctuary. Why? Because there is no fear of God. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 and I believe 8 verse 13 it says, The fear of God is the, the, the beginning of the wisdom. What's going to happen to them? Verse 12, one-third of you shall die of the pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. One-third shall fall by the sword all around you, and I will scatter another third to all the winds and will draw out a sword after them. Verse 13, thus shall my anger be spent, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be avenged, and they shall know that I am the Lord, that I, the Lord, have spoken. <laughs> and you see, I, the Lord, the word there, the Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That word there, Lord, is Yahweh. And if that's Yahweh, and he is going to execute judgment upon the people there, then that Lord there, Yahweh, is the Lord of hosts, God, the Lord, God of armies. And if it is indeed Yahweh, <laughs> the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, then that, that Lord there, that Yahweh, is Jesus, none other than Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Uh, because Revelation tells me that that's exactly what he's going to do. You want to hear what he's going to do? Let me tell you what he's going to do. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called faithful and true, and in, in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one except himself, no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it shall strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself threads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Huh. That's none other than Jesus Christ, of course. That's Yahweh. That's the Lord. Amazing. In verse 17, I mean, verse 14 to 17, we have the explanation why he's going to do that. Why so, such severe punishment? Number one is to prove to the nations what God is going to do to them too. And to tell them that if Israel was judged, and Israel is God's people, and Jerusalem was God's city, and if they were judged, if Jerusalem was judged, and if Israel was judged, 
for their sin, what do you think God is going to do with us? What do you think God is going to do with the United States of America? What is he going to do with the rest of the world? Here's, he answers the why. Moreover, verse 14, Ezekiel 4, uh, 5, Moreover, I will make you a waste and a reproach among the nations that are all around you in the sight of all who pass by. So it shall be a reproach, a, ton, a lesson, and an astonishment to the nations that are all around you when I execute judgment among you in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I send against them the terrible arrows of famine, which will be for destruction, which I will send to destroy you, I will increase the famine upon you and cut off your supply of bread. So I will send against you famine, and wild beasts, and they will bury you. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring this word against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bring this word against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Have you heard the saying, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Have you, have you heard that? Well, that's wrong. It should say this, you should say, or they, they should say it like this, God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, that settles it. Because he says, I, the Lord, have spoken. <laughs> and what do we do with all of these things? Well, again, with privilege comes responsibility. To the people of Israel who have seen the miracles, to the people of Israel who call themselves God's people, God's city and all of that, great privilege brings great responsibility. And if God judged the nation of Israel, what is he going to do with us? Well, it reminds us that the times we're living in right now are so crucial. This is the time when we really need to be serious about our walks with the Lord. God will punish sin. There's no question about that. But God will continue to proclaim the reliability and the trustworthiness of his word. Because he is God. And what is it? What do we do with that? What do we do with all of these things? How do we apply these things here? And, and, and how do we go about you know, things here that will really make us see the need for a change or whatever we need to apply? It says here that this is the impact of the judgment, famine, wild beast, pestilence, blood, and a lot of dead people. And this is the word of the Lord. And so what do we do with these things? Well, turn in your Bibles real quick. With this, we're going to close to 1 Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> with this, we close. And we're going to just bring this before the Lord so that he will teach us to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to read in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. Get the context here. You're there? Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Be clothed with humility, meaning relate to one another with humility. That's what it means here. Why? Because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, therefore... Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourselves. The word there for humble is in the passive tense, meaning in order for you to be humble. You don't say like, well, I'm going to be humble. Then you're not humble. <laughs> when it says this, submit yourself to God and he will make you. He will do it. He has to make it. He has, to, he has to make this possible. He will humble, humble you under his mighty hand. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Verse 9, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, 
perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. What do we say? Amen. I don't know if you've been watching the news of what's going on in Israel right now, but it's possible that this attack on that hospital, that it was Hamas, that they caused the destruction of that. I believe there's video and now there's audio about that. But the, 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 the evil of that is this, that we know that these people, they are capable of doing that. They don't care. They don't care if they have to kill hundreds of thousands of people, only to bring the blame upon Israel. And what I'm saying that is because for them, there is no value of life. There is no sanctity of life. And so what's that? Well, church, and it's not to be dramatic about this, and it's not to you know, make a big thing about this, but this is the world that we live in. When there is no fear of God, there is no telling what man is capable of doing. And I, I'm sorry that I have to say this. This is our nation now. This is the way our nation is going. <laughs> and if, if, and not if, it will continue to go in this direction. What do we do? Well, Peter here clearly says this. Be watchful. Be watchful and pray. Be watchful. Our enemy, the roaring lion, is seeking whom he might devour. Be watchful. And be praying. Our redemption is drawing near, nearer than when we first believed. I do believe that. We did, uh, generations before us didn't get to see what we're seeing right now. But with greater with greater privilege comes greater responsibility. So how do we go about that? Be watchful and pray. Fathers, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for just how faithful you are. God, it really touches my heart that in the midst of judgment, you are so concerned about the well-being of your servant. And I know that it is painful to read these things and the devastation. Just to imagine people eating their own babies. And we tremble just to consider the evil in the hearts of men, the wickedness when there's no fear of God in the hearts of men. And I pray, Lord, for your mercy upon the United States of America. We see these things, God, and the only thing we can ask ourselves, why, why, why you're not judging this country? And then the answer is because you're long suffering. You're the God of mercy and grace, and yet, we continue to abuse your grace. And we continue to reject you. It is unbelievable to even imagine that this is the greatest nation at one point, the greatest nation in the world. And yet to think that this is going to be judged in such a way that it could even be worse than these conditions we just read in Ezekiel. So, Father, I pray that we Christians, we will really take our relationship with you with all the seriousness that it requires. Father, that you will not allow any of your kids, none of us, to be deceiving or to be disobedient. Father, that in no way we will defile your sanctuary. And not just the building our own lives, for we are the temple of your spirit. And a Father, that you will teach us to worship you in spirit and truth. And as we go about our daily lives, searching the scriptures, being filled with your spirit, I pray.
pray, Lord, that we will not become like the nations or the people around us, but that we will indeed be light in the midst of darkness, truth, truth in the midst of so much deception, hope in the midst of so much chaos, integrity in the midst of so much corruption, that we individuals, men and women, will be men and women of character. For that's what this nation needs. There's hope in Christ Jesus and in no one else. And it is our privilege to bring Jesus to the world that is dying in wickedness and sin. Help us, Lord, to live our lives for Jesus Christ. Fill us with your spirit. Father, it is my prayer right here, right now, even here right now, that you will descend your Holy Spirit upon your people. And that you will touch all of us. And that with a sense of urgency, we will cry out to you, God, be merciful to us. Forgive us of all of our sins. Give us the heart of Daniel to intercede for our nation that has so much, so much rejected you. Help us to see sin from your perspective. Help us to tremble at just even imagining the depth of your judgment when it comes upon those who hate you. Make us a church that is really all about Jesus Christ. Whether it's by many or whether it's by few. It, that, that, it doesn't matter. Our strength is not in the numbers. Our strength is in the Lord God who made heavens and earth. And it is in His name that we will go out every day. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we will face the world unashamed unapologetic about the truth and we will preach the truth and we will share the truth so help us God to be the people you want us to be for the honor and the glory of your name and we thank you and we will be always careful to give you all honor and glory in the name that is above all names Jesus Christ our Lord so have your way with your people we ask these things in Jesus name God bless you.